Again, we are going to focus today on content rich English language arts instruction in the primary grades. And I'm going to talk to you about a few evidence based practices from the literature. <clears throat> Thank you for the warm introduction. I, um, my background is that I served as a, a second grade teacher and a reading coach in the reading first days. Um, and I worked with uh, kindergarten through third grade reading programs um, at that time. Um, I was always very interested in children's reading because it affects all facets of life um, and all outcomes. Um, and, uh, and so I became interested in researching uh, the prevention of reading difficulties. And so my work really does focus on how to prevent reading difficulties. I do a lot of work in the preschool space and kindergarten space. When I think about the K through two space, I'm really thinking about how do we prevent later reading comprehension difficulties by building ch children's language skills and their, how their knowledge, building their knowledge connects with building their language and reading outcomes. So I'm really happy to be here um, today. Um, and in, in the presentation itself uh, that you have, the handouts you have, you have all of the presentation slides and you have links embedded in there so that you go to, go to various resources. All right. Customarily, six to eight ushers create the arch. The ushers may be commissioned officers from different branches of service and thus in different uniforms. If that many ushers are not needed, other military guests may be asked in advance to assist the ushers in performing the service. Do you understand this passage? You might understand all the words. <laughs> I, see, I see somebody going like this, but do you really know what it's saying? Well. Some of you might know what this is saying if you had the right background knowledge. You're right if you said it was the Arch of Sabres ceremony immediately following a military wedding. And here's my wedding picture from 1998. And yes, there is such a thing as the Army Wife Handbook. I think it was my first handbook I ever owned. Um, so to, to read this passage, we really need to understand the language, right? Including the vocabulary. Uh, such as customarily, ushers, commission, arch, and service. Along with our knowledge of the language, we also use our background knowledge to read this text. And our background knowledge about this topic helps us to make inferences and to integrate new knowledge we learned with the knowledge we already have to, ha to achieve a deeper level of comprehension. When we don't have background knowledge for a text, we have a lot of trouble understanding it or learning from it. Well, in the popular national discussion on the science of reading in the early grades, we often hear a lot about decoding words, right? And this is really important. Decoding is really important, but it is not the full picture of the science of reading or the science of how to teach reading. And some another thing I want to make sure to kind of make explicit is that sometimes people think of the early elementary years as learning to read and the later years as reading to learn. Um, but instruction in comprehension cannot wait until decoding is already in place. We have to think about how to foster comprehension during the early years, because if the groundwork is not laid during the early years in terms of language and knowledge, they're going to, children are going to have trouble in comprehension as they read text later on. So in terms of a framework, we often hear about the simple view of reading where reading comprehension is the product of decoding and language comprehension. Again, in this equation, decoding is an essential part of reading comprehension, but there is a clear consensus that language comprehension is also critical to successful reading. Um, and I have to be able to read words and decode them, but I also have to be able to understand what they're saying to be a, a successful reader. I'm focusing today on the language comprehension side of the symbol view. Another way to look at this is the Scarborough's rope. And this is basically saying something very similar here. We're focusing on the language comprehension side today and not the word recognition side. Again, I'm not minimizing the word recognition side 
but I want to focus here on language comprehension. And if you notice here, there are things like background knowledge and then vocabulary and language structures, verbal reasoning and literacy knowledge. But really the focus today, we're gonna to talk about vocabulary and some, some language structures, such as syntactical knowledge and semantics and uh, background knowledge. So academic language skills, let's start there. I think of academic language skills as serving as a bridge between the casual everyday language register that we use to talk to one another and the formal language register that's used in books. So a lot of times in books, there are words that are very um, rare. Here's an example. So in terms of rare words, that means um, that's roughly outside of the vocabulary of a fourth to sixth grader. Um, research, this is a pretty old research now, but it's still, it's an oldie but a goodie. Um, you can see here that the amount of rare words in children's book, and this is a simple children's book you would read to a preschool aged child, has more rare words than when college graduates talk to one another as friends, okay? So this is saying, that kids need exposure to the language of books because they won't get the language of books in our everyday conversations necessarily. And these are the kinds of words that you might find on a third grade uh, standardized reading test. Students have to be able to read these on their own. And if you look at these words, these aren't words, a lot of these are not words I would use in my conversations. So, and, and also the texts that students read in K through two don't contain a lot of these words. So where are they gonna get exposure to these words unless someone reads aloud to them regularly? This is from the Institute of Education Sciences practice guide from the What Works Clearinghouse. And um, this defines academic language as the formal communication structures and words that are common in books and school. Um, and academic language skills are those skills that enable the use of academic language to use and comprehend academic language. And these are things like inferential language skills, which is the ability to talk about topics beyond the here and now narrative language skills, which can be fiction or non-fictional relation of a series of events, and academic vocabulary knowledge and syntactical structures that are very specific to um, the way um, our written language functions. So let's start by thinking about how important conversations are to build academic language skills. Okay, I know I just said that our everyday interactions are not gonna necessarily be enough to build those academic language skills, but we need at least those, okay? So let's talk about how do we have conversations and what does the conversation literature say about this? A lot of this literature is taken, uh, research base is from the preschool research base because there's been a lot of work in that space. Um, and the idea is that conversational interactions where students are active participants and where teachers are responsive partners is meaningful to children's language learning. There may be a lot of talk in classrooms, but not all talk is conversation. Thank you to those of you who have given me smiles. I appreciate that. Um, so what does it mean to have a conversation? A conversation is a group of semantically contingent utterances between two or more speakers that make up multiple turns on the same topic. And what is, that just means that I take a turn, you take a turn, I take a turn, you take a turn on the same topic, or I take a turn, Beth takes a turn, John takes a turn, and then I take a turn on the same topic. That's a four turn conversation. And that's kind of like a minimum rule of thumb to have a four turn conversation. Now it would be, might be surprising you, to you to know that 
the extent to which that happens, at least in um, early childhood classrooms where this has been studied, where you think there would be a lot of conversation going on, there's not a lot that stays on a topic. It usually shifts very rapidly. So even the, the four-turn conversation is not as frequent as you would think. But teacher talk is important. This, in this graph, this is a work by Hutton Locker and colleagues that shows that um, in classrooms, that what teachers say affect children's language learning. There is a direct correspondence between the classroom language environments and the amount of ch language that children produce um, and their growth. In, uh, in their understanding of syntax and language. So children are using, um, when teachers use proportionately more complex language, children tend to gain more language comprehension skills. Let's look at a mechanism of why that may be the case. So children tend to mirror the complexity of teachers talk in terms of their syntax. So if a teacher says, this clock tells us the time and we can move the hands, the child might say, can I move the hands on the clock and change the time? And then vice versa. If a child says, can I move the clock and, uh, hands on the clock and change the time, the teacher might say, of course you could move the hands on the clock and change the time. So that might be, that illustrates one way that contingent talk or back and forth conversations uh, that teachers and students have on the same topic um, might lead to some of these complexity gains in complexity. But in summary, the, the features of high quality language uh, conversations include maintaining multiple turns on one topic, um, teachers eliciting student participation, so asking open ended questions, and then also extending what students are saying. Okay. In the K through two classroom, this can look like, you, we do need to have conversations throughout the day, but one context in which to have conversations is interactive read alouds. The, the, the read aloud context gives students and teachers some, a, a rich context for discussion before, during, and after the read aloud experience and exposes children to academic language um, of books and texts. So going back to the simple view, you know, we often think about um, comprehension um, and we think about that being just the language skills contributing to comprehension. But I want us to also think right now about how knowledge and uh, our knowledge, and when I talk about knowledge, I'm specifically talking about content knowledge and science and social studies topics. Uh, I recognize that there are many forms of knowledge, but right now I'm talking about content related knowledge. Um, the knowledge that a person brings to a text is essential for their understanding. It's the chief determinant on whether they will understand that text. And reading theories consistently showcase that its important role. Again, when we come back to Scarborough's rope, background knowledge is implicated in the language comprehension side. So returning back to our original passage, um, the, again, what you knew about this determined if you could understand it, right? So when we systematically build students' content knowledge during English language instruction, English language arts instruction, this integration may be a more powerful approach than traditional literacy instruction. Let's talk about why that might be. So I love this uh, visual of the tip of the iceberg. Some people think about vocabulary as the tip of the iceberg of a person's conceptual knowledge. So their content knowledge, every, all these things that they know, we measure by their vocabulary. So intentionally and strategically building their knowledge may actually accelerate that vocabulary and language learning. It's so very, those uh, language and vocabulary are highly related. It's really hard to parse out the, the differences here. So research shows that insufficient time is spent on science and social studies instruction in the elementary grades, 
particularly the primary grades. And before you think that I'm blaming anybody or, throw, or slinging mud, I'm not trying to do that. In fact, it was really um, reading instruction that became kind of the bully. Um, in the early 2000s, when the National Reading Panel Report came out and everybody started learning about the big five areas um, um, of reading instruction, phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, comprehension, the reading during that era, the blocks of time spent on reading got expanded greatly, and it really seemed to be a key for um, a key factor in pushing out the content areas. So, um, research does show that, unfortunately, particularly in the primary grades, content area instruction is not really an area of focus. But I would argue um, that it is critical to reading success and to comprehension success to build the knowledge early. Because knowledge, just like language, takes time to build. And it doesn't just build overnight. It's all the accumulation of what we've been learning since birth. Um, so how will young children build content knowledge if we don't have enough time dedicated to it? And then if our English language arts instruction is primarily focused on um, is kind of agnostic of content. There might, be, there might be topics that are discussed, but not really a focus of building content. Well, one way that um, large districts in the US and curriculum developers have been approaching this problem is by integrating content into the English language arts block. Okay. This is not the only solution, but it is one type of solution that people are using right now. In practice, I do want to say something about activating versus building knowledge. So activating knowledge, we've heard a lot about activating knowledge, right? Teachers might ask students to think about what they know about a topic before reading uh, the text. But if I don't have the background knowledge for a given text in the first place, how can it be activated? No amount of activation will help me access knowledge I don't have to begin with. So how can we systematically build this knowledge? I love this video um, from Susan Newman on why knowledge matters. I've, it, throughout my presentation, I've embedded some links for you to, to go check out later. Um, uh, it, it makes you think about this issue. So a lot of times also when curricula say building knowledge, sometimes they're just look and see if they're talking about activating knowledge. So although we know that background knowledge is an essential component of comprehension, systematically building that knowledge is often left out of the discussion on the science of how to teach reading in the primary grades. Okay. And again, reading instruction and science and social studies have been traditionally disconnected. And like we said earlier, science and social studies is receiving a short shrift in the early grades in terms of instructional time. Again, not through the fault of teachers and schools, and one way to think about this is to integrate and have a content-rich English language arts approach. I define it like this, a curriculum that's designed to simultaneously build literacy skills and content knowledge can be considered a content-rich English language arts approach. So it's more than just reading informational books to children. It is, it's about thinking about how do you also build their knowledge and planning instruction around that. So what does the research say about whether content-rich English language arts approaches actually improve student learning? I want to first consider what we know um, about K-5 integrated approaches in general. Any approach that integrates literacy and content knowledge, whether it's in English language arts or in science and social studies, um, my colleagues and I recently conducted a meta-analysis where we looked at experimental or, or quasi-experimental studies 
uh, quasi-experimental studies is, is, is one that has a treatment and a comparison group, but there's no random assignment to the groups, okay? An experimental study, what distinguishes an experiment is that groups, the treatment and control are been randomly assigned, whether it's schools randomly assigned to condition, children randomly assigned to condition, or, or classrooms randomly assigned to condition. So there are standards from the U.S. Department of Education, the Institute of Education Sciences, which is the research arm of the U.S. Department of Education, through the What Works Clearinghouse has standards of, um, uh, of rigor and, uh, and, and quality. Um, we looked at the studies um, in K through five that were experiments or quasi experiments that met some sort of minimum standard for quality. And these just showed that when you integrate literacy and content knowledge approaches, there's a moderate to large effect on vocabulary and comprehension. There's even an, an effect on standardized measures of comprehension. Um, so beyond research or developed measures of comprehension, there's some effect on generalized comprehension. And there's large effects on content knowledge as well. Now, again, those studies varied considerably on what they looked like, but they had some key features um, that were common across the studies and namely this integration, this intentional integration. Let me talk more specifically about what we know in the K through two space. So in the K through two space, there aren't very many studies. There are a handful of experimental and quasi-experimental studies um, that look at content-rich ELA approaches. Um, some of the, you can see the list there that um, there's some non-commercially available approaches that have been studied. Uh, my colleague, um, Jimmy Kim from Harvard University um, studies the model of reading engagement. Um, the, there's something called content area literacy instruction by Carol Connor and colleagues and science ideas by Vitalian Romance. Those all had positive effects on learning. In terms of commercially available programs that are content rich, World of Words, Susan Newman's program is a supplemental program um, that supports vocabulary learning. Project Place Units from Project Based Learning by Nell Duke and colleagues. And the Core Knowledge Language Arts Knowledge Strand Curriculum. Um, I'm gonna speak just briefly on this curriculum. Um, my work, I've, I've conducted a randomized control trial in kindergarten on core knowledge. There's also more, um, there's also some evidence that is not yet in a published uh, peer reviewed journal, but I would expect soon to be about um, ARC core. Um, and they had some positive findings as well, and they had studied it in the kindergarten space. Briefly, in terms of core knowledge language arts, um, my colleagues and I, including um, Jimmy Kim um, from Harvard University and, and Thomas White from the University of Virginia and Heijin Huang, um, we looked, did, conducted two randomized control trials in kindergarten in large urban districts in the US. Um, and we found that the knowledge strand, we only tested the knowledge strand, so we didn't test the skill strand. They're decouplable in kindergarten through second grade. And we found that there was an impact on vocabulary and knowledge in kindergarten on both proximal and standardized generalized measures. And uh, we, I, um, this was a rather profound finding for me after, it was basically after a semester of instruction that there was a generalized impact on vocabulary learning in kindergarten. Um, now, just disclaimer, um, this study, I'm not a developer of this curriculum. Um, this study was funded by the Institute of Education Sciences and not by Amplify, so I don't have connections to Amplify um, or anything like that. Um, but I was interested in studying, a pro I, I study approaches that are integrative. I don't necessarily advocate for any one curriculum, but I do want you to consider what are the evidence-based practices that effective content-rich English language approaches have in common? Okay, and so this is across those studies that I just showed you uh, that are in the K through two space. What are some of those content rich ELA approaches that they have in common? Um, some of the features are planning units around science and social studies topics, using conceptually coherent text sets ordered to build content knowledge, discussion and writing focused on building content knowledge, and explicitly teaching relationships among words. Let's talk about each of these. 
First, planning units around science or social studies topics. <clears throat> so the content rich English language arts approach would have units that are focused on science and social studies content, and that would be the driver of instruction. Uh, for example, farms or Native Americans or Arctic animals or um, economic practices. Um, typical instruction uh, often focuses on themes instead of topics or content concepts. For example, what makes me special? What can we try when we learn new things? Um, have a more theme-based approach. Okay. And uh, teaching the idea, something really important to note is that this, I, this Connect, teaching connected ideas within a topic and considering the organization among these ideas, it really seems to be occurring at the level of the unit planning and not individual lesson planning. So I think that this piece of it uh, maybe lays a foundation for the rest of it to occur. It's the way the curriculum is designed uh, with building knowledge in mind. So here's some examples of um, standards, NGSS standards and other standards um, and concepts that could be taught at different grade levels. This comes from an article that my colleagues and I, uh, led by Hei-Jin Huang, my, um, my postdoctoral scholar at the Florida State University. Um, we put out this article, there's a link to it in your, in your handouts and it has all of these kind of tables and, and we discuss each of these features in detail. <clears throat> But here's an example of how a concept, for example, in K1, how characteristics of animals develop based on their needs is really comes from the content standard. Okay? And you can see that in grades two and three and four and five examples. So there's a content standard and then concepts are derived from there. One of the um, pitfalls that we um, often see <clears throat> is that units are designed around literacy skills, such as finding the main idea. We would advocate if you want a content rich English language arts approach to start with the content and weave in the uh, comprehension strategies where they make the most sense. So I do not advocate for no comprehension strategies. There's good evidence that comprehension strategies are useful and valuable and work. Um, but there's also evidence needing a content rich focus. So I, I'm not one of the either or people. I, uh, I think both can be. Um, uh, done well together. So now let's talk about conceptually coherent text sets that are ordered to build content knowledge. Okay, so you have this, you're planning units around science and social studies topics, and you're going, you want to think about what texts do we use. These can be read alouds or students can read them. I'm going to present to you four read aloud books right now, um, but think about, you, you, you don't have to th think about it exclusively as read aloud, right? Students can be doing the reading. In fact, having, having texts that students can read on the topic is a useful um, way to help, um, even before, even if they're reading simple texts. So here, but here's a conceptually coherent text set that's a read aloud. So the first book, Growing Vegetable Soup, is an informational narrative book. Um, and it focuses on what do plants need and how can we help plants. Book two, Plants in the Spring, is an informational text about, and that adds on to this idea, how can plants help us? So we looked at what do plants need and how can we help plants to how can plants help us? And then Book three, how, how can plants, different plants help us in different ways? So this is about how a seed grows. And then how do plants and animals help each other and why should we grow plants? You can notice here that this text set is deliberately, has multiple genres. It's not just informational texts. So um, you don't have to think about content rich approaches as just being informational texts. Okay. Um, in fact, uh, among the content rich English language arts approaches that we studied, there were, um, uh, there were studies that, like Susan Newman's studies on World of Words, that were very deliberate about providing a range of genre to motivate students and to build their learning. Here's a, a table um, that shows how you can have 
simple texts, more complex texts, and the most complex texts on, um, on particular things. So for example, in K1, how characteristics of animals develop based on their needs. Um, in this table, you'll see that, that um, you can um, also make sure that you're hitting the important literacy standards for different texts while building the concept. Okay. Again, this table is taken directly from the Huang et al. 2020 article that you have a link to. One of the pitfalls here that we ask you to avoid would be not sequentially exposing children to more challenging aspects of a topic to deepen knowledge, meaning that a lot of times we're not thinking about that in our literacy and uh, the text we're reading aloud to kids, that deepening of knowledge. But think about how a text set together coheres and deepens the knowledge, not just is it, are these things on roughly the same topic and do they kind of relate to one another, okay? Um, and again, I would encourage you to also have books that students can read themselves in addition to the read aloud text. In social studies, some of the studies that we um, examined used primary source materials such as diaries or interview transcripts, artifacts like photographs, letters and documents. Um, all of these uh, are very important in thinking about teaching in the discipline and so we recommend integrating these kinds of read alouds or, or into uh, instruction as well. In fact, this with these text sets, this gives you a very good way to have these content rich interactive read aloud sessions where um, in, in the body of work on reading aloud to children. While the book is important, the extra textual talk surrounding the read aloud is also important. So all the things that are said between teachers and children outside of the text itself is related to improved language learning before, during, and after the read aloud. In addition, content rich read alouds are generally more syntactically complex than students reading levels, probably by about two grade levels. So um, that's important that we aren't just reading aloud texts to them that they can read themselves, right? we're reading aloud more syntactically complex text. And again, informational texts um, appear to influence the types of questions teachers pose. They, they pose more complex questions when using informational texts. And when teachers ask, ask more complex questions, children tend to reply in more complex ways. Um, and, uh, but that being said, different genre, a coherent text set can and should span multiple genres. All right, let's move on to discussing, discussion and writing focused on building knowledge. So we talked about planning, using conceptually coherent texts, and now let's talk about discussion and writing. So the key here is that the discussion and writing is focused on building knowledge, not just responding to the text. Now, if, if you're, um, if you're, curriculum is designed in such a way that the planning has been planned around the units, then it's more likely that the focus of those questions will be to build the knowledge. Um, but connect, it's important to connect prior learning to new learning, elicit student contributions by asking open-ended questions, um, inferential questions, like I said, inferential questions elicit inferential language from children. And again, inferential just means talking beyond the here and now. This, uh, and um, sometimes people talk about it as decontextualized language. And then discussion after the book reading is related to expressive vocabulary growth. So that the, it's important to have those discussions uh, before, during, and after. Um, and extending what children say, those are all things just like in conversation that can go on during the discussion. Here is an example from the IES practice guide that I was talking about earlier. Um, in this example, the teacher is um, talking about cheetahs. She said, this book is about cheetahs. Cheetahs are a kind of cat. They're actually a type of wild cat. Wild cats are different from cats. We have pets in our home. I have a cat. Is your cat a wild cat or a pet? She's my pet. Yes, if your cat lives in an, at your house, she is a pet. How would you describe your cat? She is gray. She is nice and soft. Okay, so you would describe your cat as gray, nice and soft. Can you put the question and answer together in one sentence? So the teacher gives language to the student 
to put the answer together, but then talks about things like, what, what makes wildcats seem wild? Okay, so this is just an example of how teachers can um, promote inf inferential language use. Now, engaging students in writing provides an opportunity for students to use new writing as a tool for extending understanding. So it's not just, again, responding to text read in writing, but it's what distinguishes a content-rich ELA approach is that writing is meant to build and to deepen knowledge. Um, for example, after researching survival of an Arctic animal, students um, wrote an argumentative piece, could you survive in the Arctic? And this was first graders. Okay, this was in work by um, Kim et al. And they used the tree strategy, which is a, a writing strategy that has, has some research behind it. Topic sentence, reason for their opinions, examine each reason from the audience's perspective and an ending. And they use this tree strategy with younger students than have been typically used in the past, um, showing that younger students, these are, again, these were first graders, can think and write in these ways. And those of you who work with young children, even preschoolers, kindergartners, they can think in these ways for a long period of time. So encouraging them to write in these ways is also important. And in the earlier grades in kindergarten, for example, students aren't producing a lot of writing. How can you sup, um, how can you scaffold things for them where you might also be doing the writing as they're, com they're composing, you might actually be writing or you really scaffold and support what they're writing, but there's no reason for them not to be able to engage in this sort of thinking. Here's an example of um, ways that um, hands-on activities, reading, writing, and connections to discussions can be made about different concepts. For example, um, the properties of ele electric and um, magnetic forces that increase or decrease the magnetism between objects in grades two and three. A hands-on activity might be an experiment where students tested magnets with different properties and identified how the force of magnetism changes. Connecting to reading, students made hypotheses about what will happen in the experiment after reading a book called What's the Attraction? Then students recorded the observation of the magnet throughout the experiment in terms of writing, and they shared their findings on whether their hypothesis was proved or disproved in discussion. So you can see how those things fit together very nicely and are very motivating for students um, and make sense around the topic. And it is pulling in the reading and the writing all, uh, all together. And finally, thinking about how do you teach relationships among words? I love the spider web imagery for this because when you think about a semantic network or how words and ideas are related in our minds, you think about a really well-designed spider web. Now, a really well-designed spider web is tight. Flies don't fly through, they get caught, right? Just like knowledge gets, we get caught in a tight web of ideas, right? If, but if we have looser associations between ideas, our web is loose and things can zip right through them without us even realizing and having an anchor. But children with wider breadth of knowledge and vocabulary build wider and stronger networks of information to draw upon while reading or listening to a text. Explicitly teaching relationships among words, um, you know, has to do with thinking about how words are related to one another. Okay, so here in this example, students are, if they're knowledgeable about plants, they might, meet, might be able to know the meanings of words like stems and roots and uh, flower and um, all of it makes sense within a, a larger um, idea. If you talk to students about the Senate, if students know that the Senate belongs to the category of the legislative branch, they're more likely to develop conceptual knowledge about the function of the Senate than those who are not aware of this relationship. This is an image taken from textproject.org that has a lot of support around this um, area, uh, this concept of, but if you think of, if we continue with plants, plants and where they grow could be um, in the middle of a map. And then you have general types of plants on one side and then the parts of plants on the other. 
Um, so there are ways to organize our learning of words that will help students um, to really put these ideas into um, a larger other concepts. And again, textproject.org is a great site to, to find more information uh, about how to do this. The point is, as we think about how to teach words and relationships between words, children hear and use words repeatedly and their understanding deepens through conceptually coherent text sets and explicit vocabulary teachings and discussion around these words. Here's another type of, oh, another, it's called a concept of definition map. And this is about magnetism. And as you can see, there's just different ways that you can map. For example, this maps the types of magnetic objects versus the characteristics of the magnetic objects. And these are examples of categorically connected words. In K, uh, if, we, if we carry through the magnetic example in grades K through, uh, to second through third grade, you have magnetic object, magnetic field, temporary magnet, permanent magnet, repel, attract, electric current, poles, conductor. Okay. Um, students can create that concept of definition map based on these kinds of words. Now, I'm not saying that, please don't meet, take this to say that only content specific words should be taught. That, that's not what I'm trying to say. There's definitely a place for those general purpose, which many refer to as tier two vocabulary words, right? The high mileage words that we'll see again and again. However, when thinking about what are the kind of content rich words, what's, what, what's gonna really help drive understanding of the topic more deeply and choose words that way. Here are ways that some examples of ways that words are related. So words can be related um, thematically, um, for example, being involved in the same event like rain and umbrella or spatially or causally related like car and garage. Um, they don't share inherent characteristics, but they all belong to a schema. So worms, garden, and rake would be thematically related, related words. Words can also be categorically related. Categorically are things of the same type or category, what I just showed you earlier with the plants. For example, hammer, chisel, screwdriver are all kinds of tools. Goldfish, tilapia, and pike are all kinds of fish. Synonyms. Words could be related in that they are synonyms or words that mean generally the same thing. For example, a book could contain the words confident, bold, brash, and self-reliant. Those are related to one another. Antonyms could be related because they're opposites, right? Rich and poor, elated and dejected, leisurely and hurried. And then part to whole relationships. Words might be a part of a whole like toes and feet tuba and orchestra. Those are all ways in which words are related. I think what I focused on prior to this slide is the categorically related types of words. So it's not that any one way of these are better than another way. What I want you to think about is how are the ways in which I am teaching words and how words are related to one another furthering students' knowledge. So I wanna put a couple of different caveats here now. So you heard me say a few things. I'm gonna repeat them here, that comprehension strategies instruction is often integrated into effective approaches. So it's not an either or, either it's comprehension strategies or knowledge building, it can be both of those things. And in some of the effective approaches that we looked at, um, that was the case, that there was some integration and some of them, they weren't integrated and some they were. Um, more research is needed on how to better integrate them but I don't think the answer is ignoring the research on comprehension strategies. Um, I think the answer is how do we teach in such a way that would take advantage of all of the research findings. Um, and again, general purpose vocabulary is still important to teach alongside content vocabulary. So those things that you've learned about that are not gone out the window. And importantly, if a program doesn't integrate these features, it doesn't mean it's a bad literacy program. Okay. It just might mean it's not a content rich program. Maybe it's not designed to be building children's content systematically. That's what I'm focusing on here. So if you are interested in having a program that is content rich, I think the first place to look is what is my existing program? And 
does it, to what extent does it take advantage of the findings in the extant literature uh, in those four areas, which I'll show, up, show again in a moment, planning units around science and social studies topics, using conceptually coherent text sets, discussion and writing focused on building knowledge and teaching relationships among words. To what extent does your English language arts curriculum take advantage of that of those features? And in what area might we want to supplement your existing curriculum? And then what's one step you can take in this direction? So um, right now, I want us to um, break out into um, breakout rooms and these welcome gonna... back. Um, I would love to kind of understand some of your reflections. Um, and I think maybe one of the, if you feel comfortable unmuting and talking, that would be excellent. Or if you wanted to drop in something in the chat, that's fine too. Um, what were some of your kind of takeaways? And then we'll move into a time of question and answer. But first, what are some of your takeaways um, from, from your discussions? Don't be shy. I'll jump in because okay. I do that. Um, uh, the group I was in, we talked about the need kind of um, if you are going to supplement with more knowledge building text to really make that a team discussion even or even a district decision. So it's not so it's more equitable so that all kids are getting that rich experience and, and also more brains working on that together gives you a better chance of hearing from a broad array of voices and suggestions about text. So. I think that's an imp that's Im important. Um, in, in also thinking about how your English language arts and science and social studies relates to one another um, rather than being independent pieces um, and, and thinking about that throughout you know, your school um, versus just in isolation is important. Um, I see that there's a comment about there's a lot of variations district to district on what resources are used. Absolutely. Um, and that's why, you know, I, I'm not advocating for any one curriculum. Um, I, I want to share with you the approaches that seem to, the commonalities among the approaches that among effective approaches. Um, and when I, when I say effective, I mean that they have been shown in a, an experiment or a quasi experiment to improve children's um, learning. Um, Barbara puts a comment of uh, where to begin. Um, that's that's hard. I think I I personally think um, beginning with looking at what you're already doing, and not just looking at just the English language arts, right? But also looking at science and social studies. What are you doing to build knowledge? And is that um, and can you find ways to integrate literacy learning into that? Um, does anybody else have any ideas around where to begin? I think that's such an important question. Leslie says, I wonder how difficult it is for families moving from one district to another to learn how different programs work. So that's a really good point. If we have different programs and they're building knowledge and children have to insert themselves into a new program. Um, so one of the ways I think about this is if our Programs are following our state standards. Hopefully there'll be some continuity. However, you're right, you might've covered it um, in September and then moved in, moved in October and then recovering that, that knowledge base. I think that's a really tricky one. What else did you take away? Erin says the structures for teachers to design and plan units are often not in place. Do teachers have knowledge and time to plan? I think that's a really good observation there. Um, I do think that teachers um, need to have uh, the su professional supports in place to support them. Teachers are doing an awful lot and should not be expected to be experts in every single thing that they're doing. Um, otherwise, they would have, you know, multiple, multiple. PhDs across all these different areas, right? Teachers are amazing, um, but they, we have to support teachers in ways. And when I like to think about how does the curriculum support the teacher, but then how, does, how do um, organizations that come alongside teachers it, it, and come alongside districts support that curriculum, um, build, you know, support not, not just that curriculum, but using high quality materials to um, improve children's learning, but also doing it at a district kind of level and then 
all the leadership of the district being in on it and then leadership of schools if you have literacy coaches in the schools as well as then direct support for teachers and i know that there are some organizations that do that specifically right um content for specific resources at a grade level appropriate can be hard to find yes jenna i i think that's right um i think it's easier than it was 20 years ago fortunately but still you might have read alouds that are too long for kindergarten, for example. I remember this being you know, true of like the Gail Gibbons books, which I used to love, um, but, um, but just either you have to do portions of them at a time or you can actually um, abridge them by like paper clips. I know that in, in those particular books, there's information and then there's very detailed information on, the, on certain pages. And so you can abridge them in certain ways to make the content um, more specific resources. What's harder is finding books um, that children can read themselves at young grades. Um, that's why some programs actually keep those separate. I don't know what the answer is there, whether the decoding strand should be separate from the, the knowledge building strand. Um, but then there's some approaches that really marry those well. Um, Sarah said, my group talked about social studies units and making sure they're not Eurocentric and focused on the white point of view and many commercially available curriculums are problematic. Um, some, th this brings up the question about kind of whose knowledge to teach. And um, I don't necessarily, I don't necessarily advocate for a particular set of knowledge. I don't, I, I just, um, I think it's very specific to um, the, the, the district and then and the people who are using the curriculum need to understand how the curricula were developed and um, also need to think about what's important for their community have community voices heard i do know that there is some ongoing development of curricula currently that take is trying to take more into account of pulling in community resources um, it's hard for curricula to curricula to write that in um, per se because those are very specific to, to communities um, but I, I do think this idea of whose knowledge to teach is 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 a important concern that is politically charged and will not you know won't go away and, and is not going to be easily settled. However, I do think that we should have a common set of knowledge that that everybody kind of knows about. I think that th this is this is um, um, E. D. Hirsch's point. Um, it, he um, is the head of the Core Knowledge Foundation. His point is, I don't, I've heard him say, I don't care what sequence of knowledge gets taught, just that a sequence, of, a common set of knowledge gets taught um, so that we can talk to one another. Um, so that's something to, to think about. Um, Wesley says, in my district, we have mystery science, but no writing curriculum. So I try to pair wonder stories with mystery science units. For example, there's a week of wonders that has a story about dolphins and ocean creatures. So I teach the unit on water cycle and oceans at the same time, and then end with opinion writing on ocean animals. And it takes a lot of time to match them together to give kids a sense of themed units. But I would say it takes a lot of time, right? But it seems well worth it. So Wesley is talking about this important thing where you're taking what you have are doing in ELA and trying to match science, match it across the day um, where it makes more coherent sense for children. And then integrating literacy into um, science and integrating si uh, science into literacy simultaneously. Um, and Scott agrees that that's a fantastic approach. Um, there was also a one question that came before this. Um, Beth or John, can you remind me of the question? I think it was about writing. Yes, uh, let me uh, go up uh, and find that one. It was from a, from a writing perspective, how do units of study facilitate choice? So do children choose topics to write about or genres? Yeah, so I think it's the in the in the in research the research um, of different approaches uh, that have been efficacious. Um, there's different ways that they do this. So I don't think that there is like one best way that's been identified by the research. Um, the idea, though, is that children, um, whether they have choice or not. Uh, I think that children should have choice, right? And I think that genres should be varied. But it, but the the point of the writing is that is in the service of building children's knowledge. So if keeping that in mind, children are, you know, because children don't necessarily think about 
I'm going to learn about the main idea, right? They think about, I'm learning about whales. I love learning about whales. Whales are cool and they, and they love to be experts on a, on a topic, right? And in doing that, they're willing to research about that topic. They're willing to write about that topic and read about that topic. So I think that there's a lot of, a, a big piece about student motivation um, that, we, that we sometimes may be missing in some of our standard English language arts approaches. Um, again, nothing wrong with finding the main idea, but again, this, what is uh, going to be motivating for children and how do you teach the main idea within a motivating context? Any other questions as we wrap up here? So Aaron says a set of knowledge is also creating equity. Comprehension assessments that are knowledge tests. Um, if we had the same expectation of knowledge, the assessments wouldn't put students who have less knowledge at more disadvantage. Thank you for sharing. I agree that it, if we have knowledge, if we have knowledge that we're teaching that we all kind of know, we're on a level playing field, right? And that's some, that's some of the um, basis behind some of these content rich programs is that you build children's knowledge so that everybody can have a level playing field. Any other questions, closing thoughts? Well, um, I wanna share with you that I think that the science of reading, should, the lens should be widened when we talk about the science of reading to make sure we're including building knowledge and language through integrating content rich English language arts instruction. So when you think about the science of reading, I want you to think about the whole science of reading, right? You can think about not only word decoding and fluent word recognition, but also comprehension, language comprehension, and then not only just the language that goes into it, but also the knowledge that goes into language comprehension. So thank you for your time today. And um, I was very happy to be here today. Feel free to reach out to me and follow me on Twitter. <laughs>